1974, director Toby Hooper directed the now iconic horror film The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Continuing within the genre, he worked on Eaten Alive, The Fun House, and the TV miniseries Salem's Lot. After Poltergeist was the ninth highest grossing film of 1982, his talents were in high demand. He was working on what would have been the spin-off to George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, Return of the Living Dead. After working on the production for about a year, he wasn't sure if he really wanted to direct. That was when he got a call from Menachem Golan, one of the two heads of the Canon Group. Hooper met with Golan, who simply passed him a copy of a book. He said, I want you to make this film. It'll be big budget and shot in London. Hooper looked at the book titled Space Vampires. He took it home and read it over the weekend. During that time, he had many lengthy conversations with the producer, and this one movie evolved into a huge multi-picture deal with Canon. It was a three-picture deal with a stipulation that he had to either direct or produce a sequel or remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Up to this point, Canon, under Golan Globus, had been churning out very successful lower-budgeted films. Movies like Enter the Ninja, Death Wish 2, and Breakin' were all lower-budgeted hits, and Canon was looking to up their ante. They wanted to break into the big-budget blockbuster arena, and thought there would be no one better to do this with than Toby Hooper. Hooper passed on directing Return of the Living Dead, and writer Dan O'Bannon took the helm. Hooper was incredibly excited over the prospect of Space Vampires, because it had a massive $25 million budget. He also had complete creative freedom, which made him giddy. He wanted to go back to his roots and make a 70mm hammer film. While working on Space Vampires, Hooper had another meeting with Golan. He asked him what kind of films he liked. Hooper mentioned he was a big fan of the 1953 film Invaders from Mars, directed by William Cameron Menzies. Shortly thereafter, Golan informed the director that they had acquired the remake rights to Invaders from Mars. Since they were hoping to get all these films out quickly, Hooper started pre-production for Invaders from Mars while in post-production for Space Vampires. Space Vampires was changed to Life Force, and if you want to know more about that, check out my video from a few years ago. Life Force flopped, but it did nothing to damage or dissuade the director's relationship with Canon. Hooper left London and prepared to shoot the remake of Invaders from Mars in Los Angeles. While Hooper had primarily done horror up to this point, he thought this would be the perfect opportunity for him to do his version of a kid's movie. He had a big budget for Invaders from Mars which had conflicting reports of costing somewhere between $7 million and $12 million, still much less than Space Vampires. While the movie was going to be a remake, Hooper wanted to keep it as close as possible to the original, but to update the effects and cut down on the exposition. He also changed the last name of the main family. In the original, their last name was McLean. In his version, he changed it to Gardner. The movie was going to be about a young boy, David Gardner, who one night sees an alien spaceship landing close to his house. People all around the town start acting weird, and he uncovers a plot by the aliens to take over the Earth. Hooper wanted the film to carry many of the themes from the original, things that were still relevant. The original was very much steeped in the fear of communism, that your friend or neighbor was no longer who you thought they were. Little David was seeing people who he trusted acting weird and knew something was wrong. Hooper thought the film would be interesting. It played like Invasion of the Body Snatchers from a child's perspective. Hooper wanted this film to be big. He surrounded himself with some of the best of the best at the time, as well as many of his industry friends. Visual effects master John Dykstra, conceptual artist William Stout, production designer Les Dealey, writers Dan O'Bannon and Don Jacoby, director of photography Daniel Pearl, and many more. Pearl was the director's best friend, who was also the director of photography on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After working on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Pearl continued working on films, but was also an incredibly in-demand cinematographer for music videos. He made hundreds of videos with huge artists like The Police, Meatloaf, and Elton John. In 1983, he even shot the Billy Idol video for Dancing With Myself with Toby Hooper directing. One thing Hooper requested when Pearl joined him was that he wanted the film to have a rock video quality. To do that, Pearl brought in the Verilite system an array of computer-controlled programmable lights that were frequently used in huge rock concerts. He planned to use the lights for two sequences, the first when the alien ship's landing for the first time, and then later in the main hall inside the alien ship. For the special effects, he spoke to Rick Baker and Rob Bottin, but neither of which were available because they were both tied to other productions. They both told him he needed to speak to Stan Winston. Winston and his team were available, so they came on board to do the alien designs and other visual effects. While designing the drone aliens, they wanted to have something like no one had ever seen before. 
The originals had guys in suits, and with this, they wanted them to be something far more horrific. William Stout remembered talking to Rick Baker, who said the problem with guys in rubber suits is that they always look like guys in rubber suits. He said, what if we did it backwards? Stout went to Winston and mentioned this, saying how with the actors walking backwards, their knees would bend the other way, and it would be very unique, like bird's legs. They took it a step further, saying they could have bodybuilders walking on all fours with little people strapped to their backs. That way it would make the drone have six movable limbs. They also had it set up so the little person would use their legs to control the creature's mouth. For the cast, they hired Timothy Bottoms, Lorraine Newman, Bud Court, Eric Pierpoint, and James Karen. For the lead boy, he hired Hunter Carson, the son of actors Karen Black and Kit Carson. Hooper was close personal friends with the family and knew Hunter since he was little. However, he wasn't considering working with him until he saw him act in the film Paris, Texas. After that, he knew Hunter would have the right charisma to be able to properly pull off the part of David Gardner. He was then able to hire his mother, Karen Black, to play the school nurse, Linda. For the evil school teacher, Hooper asked the casting department to see if they could get award-winning actress Louise Fletcher. Fletcher won an Oscar for Best Actress as Nurse Ratched in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Hooper wanted to tie back to the original, so he had his casting team search for the original David, Jimmy Hunt. Hunt stopped acting shortly after the original film in 1953, aside from a small part in The Young Rounders in 1971. They did manage to locate him, and he was happy to come back to be in this new version of the film. Hooper knew the film had to be big. He needed a place for them to film the gigantic spaceship interiors, and no available sets were big enough. His team found the massive airport hangar located on Terminal Island in southern Los Angeles. This was the hangar used to house Howard Hughes's enormous airplane, the Spruce Goose, before its first and only flight. They planned for the ship to be about two to three stories tall. Hooper wanted the walls to breathe like it was alive. He worked with art director Craig Stearns, William Stout, and production designer Les Dilly, who worked with H.R. Giger on Alien. The idea was that the inside of the ship was like being in the belly of the whale in Pinocchio. Unfortunately, that was one element that was just too ambitious, and they had to drop it. The inside of the ship still has a sort of biological look to it, but it doesn't move like it's alive. Many of the other interiors were shot on sets in L.A. The school was Eagle Rock Elementary School, in the Eagle Rock neighborhood of L.A., the Gardner's home was the house built for the 1948 film Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, a movie that was also remade as The Money Pit, and then remade again as Are We Done Yet? Winston and his team worked with designs from Bill Stout to build the aliens, while John Dykstra worked on the alien ships, and the production team started building the sets. Some of the folks within canon weren't happy with the script and made them do a few rewrites, mostly ways to help them bring the budget down. While this was going on, Stout contacted the United States Air Force to ask for their cooperation in making the movie. He sent them a copy of the script and waited for a response. It was getting closer to filming, and so he called them to ask for an answer. The person he spoke to said that the United States Air Force cannot be a part of this movie. He asked why. The military was clearly being shown as the heroes here, so that couldn't be the reason. The person on the phone said, It is the official position of the United States Air Force that there are no Martians or UFOs. He was starting to panic. He spoke to their storyboard artist, Keith Crossley, who was an ex-Marine. He gave him a phone number of the U.S. Marine's public liaisons officer and said, Call this guy. Stout called him and sent him a copy of the script. A day later, he spoke to the officer, who said, You will have the full cooperation of the U.S. Marines. Stout wanted to verify that there wouldn't be any problems and explain what the Air Force officer said. The Marine responded with a line they ended up using in the movie. Marines have no qualms about killing Martians. Filming started in July of 1985. It was going to be a long shoot, at least 20 weeks. They needed a military advisor, so they hired Dale Dye. He was an ex-Marine who was able to offer his expertise in how to handle the military aspects of the film. They also had him play the squad leader. The Marines went above and beyond to help with the production. Many of the Marines served as extras. All the gear was real. They allowed them to use the trucks, lights, and equipment as props. They shot a large chunk of the film on an active marine base. Early on, they established that the aliens used copper as a power source. Later in the film, there was a scene where they needed a penny to fire one of the alien guns. So one of the soldiers gives them some change to use. The storyboard artist Keith Crossley pointed out how this would never happen, as they would never carry loose change into combat. They rewrote the part so that David had a penny, which they were able to use in the gun. They also added in the line about the change. 
you don't care, I lose change in a combat, sir. While they were still working on the movie, Hooper agreed to produce and direct the sequel to The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The police chief was played by Jimmy Hunt, who was David McLean in the original. As a further homage to his role, when the police walk up the hill to look for the UFO, he says this. Gee, I haven't been up here since I was a kid. When Jimmy arrived on set, he brought with him the supreme intelligence prop from the original. When the cops are searching the building, they shine their lights on it. There was a scene that Hooper really wanted to do, and that was when the teacher eats a frog. It took him a long time to convince the actress, and she somewhat begrudgingly did it. She joked that this scene was a career ruiner. The frog was a mold made out of gummy material, and she said it tasted awful. Later in the film, Louise Fletcher had to be swallowed by one of the alien drones. Right before she did it, she said, I have an Academy Award, and I'm doing this? She was a good sport about it, and let them have the monster chomp down on her. When she's being swallowed, they did that with rubber legs so they wouldn't hurt the actress. About halfway through filming, James Cameron wanted Stan Winston to come work with him on Aliens. Winston had already done most of his work and asked Hooper if he could go and leave his guys in charge to handle anything while he was gone. Hooper didn't want to stand in the way of his career and was okay with letting him go, especially because he knew the team he was leaving behind was more than capable of handling anything that he would need. With Winston leaving, he left Alec Gillis to handle the production as the art department head. Gillis was excited, but was also nervous because this was the first time he was in this large of a leadership role. For the Supreme Intelligence, they had effects crew member Gino Crognell inside to move the puppet around. They needed him to be in a weird position, so they strapped and duct taped him to a board to lock him into place. His big scene was when the Marines shot at him, so he had to flail around. He heard, ACTION! and moved around, but after a while, he kept going, and it seemed like it was going on much longer than it should have. Suddenly, the back of the suit was ripped open, and he felt hands cutting him from the board he was taped to. The team pulled him out, and the wall behind him was engulfed in flames. The sparks from the squibs caused the chemicals in the foam walls to catch fire, and they were all rushing around to get everyone to safety. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Towards the end, David's parents are telling him he was just having a nightmare. Lorraine Newman was supposed to do a little funny voice when delivering her lines, and Hooper begged her to do the voice she did in the Coneheads. After much pleading, she agreed to deliver the lines as a Conehead. There is nothing to be afraid of, David Gardner. As an homage to the director of the original, they had the school labeled Menzies Elementary. When David's watching TV, it's playing Hooper's previous film, Life Force. The intro was inspired by the titles from 1978 Superman. The ending wasn't what the director had hoped. He wanted to do something a little more jaw-dropping than the original. In the 1953 version, it ends on a cliffhanger with David seeing the alien ship again. With the remake, it ends up with David seeing the alien ship again, but then going to see his parents and screaming. We never see what he saw. Originally, Hooper had planned for it to cut to a shot of one of the drones finishing eating his parents, and then cutting to David screaming. Unfortunately, due to a mix-up with the shot schedule, the FX guys had already wrapped, so they couldn't do the scene. After a five-month shoot, the film wrapped. It was very stressful and hard for everyone involved. Even though Cannon wanted rewrites for the script prior to filming, once filming was underway, they let Hooper do his thing and didn't interfere at all with his directing. While working on post for Invaders from Mars, Hooper was doing pre-production for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Hooper hired composer Chris Young to do the score for Invaders from Mars. He told the composer, you know the score for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? That's what I want. Young then proceeded to write something exciting and weird, the most unusual and ambitious score he had ever written, which the studio hated and threw out. They told him to go back and do a more orchestral score, which he did, and it was accepted. While he liked the orchestral score, to him it wasn't as interesting as the experimental one, but he understood why they turned the other one down. The movie was released on June 6, 1986, and was a huge flop, opening in 7th place. It only made about $4.9 million domestically. It seemed audiences weren't interested in a family film from Toby Hooper. It did better on home video, but it was still a loss. Cannon was taking a beating for the big gamble they made getting into larger production films, as these were two big flops in a row. Hooper was sad the movie did so poorly, but was proud of it, and hoped that maybe future audiences would get it. The Razzies once again proved their relevance by nominating the film for two awards, Worst Actress, Louise Fletcher, and Worst Visual Effects. It's one thing to say the film's bad, but calling the effects bad is disingenuous. 
They are some incredibly inventive effects that still hold up decades later. A few years after the film, Eric Pierpoint would go on to play in another Alien classic as Detective Francisco in the beloved but short-lived Alienation TV series. After this, Dale Dye, the military advisor, would go on to frequently work with Oliver Stone, as well as other cinema legends like Steven Spielberg and Brian De Palma. The movie was partially the inspiration for the arcade game Alien Storm, where the team of alien busters fight off shape-shifting aliens who have taken over a town in the U.S. The end battle takes place inside a giant living spaceship, and they fight a gigantic brain that bears more than a passing resemblance to the supreme intelligence. Invaders from Mars may not have pleased audiences at the time, but it has since gone on to be more appreciated over time. While it may not appeal to everyone, I think more people can now see the beauty in a kid's movie from the creator of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It certainly plays out like some bizarre child's nightmare, which is exactly what the director was going for. It's not a kid's movie like we have today. It's one of those glorious PG kids movies from back in the day where they would push the envelope for how weird they could go. PG back then still had a very rough edge. Remember, this was the director who brought us the PG-rated Poltergeist. Invaders from Mars is a solid and underappreciated remake. It's such an oddity when you look at the film overall. The movie has this bizarre tone to it, and with its fast-moving pace, it never lets up. It's quite possibly the odd duck of Hooper's catalog, and I mean that as a compliment. His films are all quality, but this one is unlike the others. It's a brutal, weird, surreal kids movie. The kind where if you showed it to kids now, they would most likely need therapy. You see, they do understand me.